Welcome to an Oral History of the Church. I'm Adam Christman. And I'm Jonathan McCormick. An Oral History of the Church is a conversational history podcast. This first volume is an oral history of the campus relocation of Golden Gate Baptist Theological Seminary's main campus, from Mill Valley, California, to Ontario, California. This sixth episode for this volume is an interview with Golden Gate Baptist Theological Seminary's Director of Theological Field Education, Chair of Leadership Formation, and Associate Professor of Ministry Leadership, Dr. Glenn Prescott. I really liked our talk with Dr. Prescott. Um, I'm slightly biased because he was my professor for Theological Field Education, and then he was one of my pastors at the church where I've been a member now for some years. I was real excited when he talked to us about uh, his interest to sit down and chat. And when we finally got to do it, I had a really good time. Yeah, Dr. Glenn Prescott has been the administrative pastor at Tiburon Baptist Church for a number of years. Yeah, up until this last fall, I believe. Maybe last mm-hmm. spring, I forget. I've really appreciated Dr. Prescott's um, ministry and leadership uh, here in the the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. Uh, He's been a gracious leader at our church, uh, very effective in caring for for people, and has been helpful in connecting with other other churches and helping them do ministry well. Um, He's he's got a great model. Yeah. He's um, he hasn't had it easy. Uh, he <laughs> has had a, a combination of jobs over recent years, being the administrative pastor at Tiburon, and then coming on with the seminary to start teaching and then doing administration for them as well. Uh, it's a pretty significant little. Uh, interaction of all these different responsibilities he's had for so long. Certainly. So what uh, would you suggest listeners give particular attention to in this upcoming interview, Jonathan? One of the components of the Master of Divinity degree is a capstone. Uh, Most masters have a written capstone at the end or some sort of practical field experience. Uh, Golden Gate's MDiv has the the latter, and it was interesting to hear a bit of the history of how ours developed and the relationship between Golden Gate's TFE and other TFE programs in other uh, seminaries around the country. Uh, I really appreciated hearing about uh, Dr. Doran McCarty's uh, leadership um, and the framework that he's provided. Yeah, and for for me, I thought it was real interesting to get his perspective on the relationship between the seminary here at, at this location and our neighbors in the community. Um, we're getting so many perspectives that, as we mentioned in previous episodes, have some core similarities with uh, unique elements in each perspective. So we we get some more of that with Dr. Prescott's interview here. On that note, let's take a moment and listen to Dr. Glenn Prescott. This is Jonathan McCormick and Adam Crispin interviewing uh, Dr. Glenn Prescott on uh, March 15th, 2016, in his office in the academic building at At 201 201 Seminary Drive, Mill Valley, California. Uh, Dr. Prescott, uh, when did you first hear of uh, Golden Gate Seminary? Uh, Having grown up uh, in the Southern Baptist Church, it's probably hard for me to put a time on that, but I recall specifically learning about Golden Gate when one of the... uh, um, Golden Gate staff members made a visit to my university when I was a college student at Eastern New Mexico uh, University in Portales. I'm 
I remember you said before that uh, you're you've you're just about born into Baptist life. That your mother came to Christ through the Million More in Fifty Four campaign. Well, they were they were already believers and already a part of a church, uh, but in uh, uh, the, the Million More in Fifty Four that uh, Southern Baptist Convention uh, adopted uh, was successful. And so they carried it on into 1955, and in April of 55, uh, the uh, 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 preschool director from uh, our church knocked on our door. Uh, My mom was seven months pregnant with me, and uh, that day I got enrolled in Sunday school. Uh, Wasn't born for a couple more months, but uh, got, got enrolled a couple months before. Where did you go to college again? College was at Eastern New Mexico a University in Portales. Okay. Uh, how did you first come to uh, to have a connection with Golden Gate? Well, during uh, during that particular visit, the the uh, uh, the visit was was a recruiting trip by this particular staff member uh, here at the seminary. Uh, and I told him, I said, my plan was to always go to Fort Worth and go to Southwestern. And he uh, he acknowledged that and said that uh, that would be a good choice. He said he was a Southwestern graduate. Um, but uh, I said, I'm just here to talk with you about seminary in general. So we would talk in general terms about seminary life and, and what seminary education was about. Uh, but uh, never, never dreaming that uh, we'd make a decision to come to Golden Gate instead. When did you uh, come to Golden Gate? Um, I right after I graduated from college in '77, I uh, was appointed as a U.S. two missionary with the Home Mission Board in those days, and went to Portland, Oregon, and uh, I worked on five different college campuses doing collegiate ministry. Um, Janet was the bookkeeper for the Northwest Convention, and we got married during my U.S. 2 term. And as we uh, finished our term, we had made the decision uh, that uh, we knew we were going to seminary. Uh, We really felt called at that point to uh, collegiate ministry. And uh, I determined I did not Uh, leave anything behind in Texas, and there was no reason to go back. So we made the decision to stay on the West Coast and to come to Mill Valley Mm -hmm. to come to the Golden Gate campus. They didn't have the Pacific Northwest campus yet. It started the next year. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I knew it was coming, but uh, we'd made the decision to go ahead and come to the main campus. So we went ahead and made the move down here. Mm -hmm. And so when you finished your uh, seminary education here, uh, did you do uh, both your doctorate and your master's here at Golden Gate, or just just the master's? Um, I ended up doing both here. Uh, We graduated with MDiv in 82. Um, We uh, we, uh, uh, left here and uh, did a 13-month staff position in San Diego. and then, uh, then returned back to the Northwest to the University of Washington, uh, where I became the college minister there. And it was during that time that I got a call from Dr. McCarty, who was uh, heading up the DMIN program, and said they were uh, getting ready to start the very first uh, college ministry uh, mm-hmm. DMIN track, mm-hmm. and asked if I wanted to be a part of that. And I, uh, I said that I did, and uh, so started... Uh, my uh, uh, DMIN experience in 86 and then graduated in 89. Hmm. Very good. And then uh, did your connection with Golden Gate continue during that time, or was there a, a gap of years between finishing DMIN and starting to work here? Uh, there, was a, there was a gap. Um, by the time I graduated in 89, we had left the Northwest and moved to the uh, Foreign Mission Board, later to become International Mission Board. And uh, during my International Mission Board days, um, I worked with uh, International Service Corps, Journeyman, and Master's programs, and ended up uh, doing recruiting 
for all of those in a variety of places. And uh, those recruiting trips uh, allowed me to visit all six of the Southern Baptist seminaries. And uh, so I had uh, frequent opportunities to come back and be a part mm-hmm. of, uh, of Golden Gate, uh, mm-hmm. even during those days. Mm-hmm. So when did you um, when did you come back to to begin work here? Okay, uh, we left the uh, uh, International Mission Board in two thousand and three uh, and went on staff uh, as an executive pastor at Tiburon, mm-hmm. uh, which is uh, just a two minutes you mm-hmm. know away from mm-hmm. from the seminary. It's Tiburon Baptist Church, mm-hmm. and um, we. Uh, um, where um, we came back to a, in a, a pretty, I would say, uh, at the end of what was a pretty critical period between the relationship between uh, the church and the seminary. Um, there was a period of time there when I understand and was told that there were no staff members, no faculty members, and virtually no students involved with the church uh, even though that was the root, roots that it started with mm-hmm. in the beginning. Uh, but by the time I got back in '03, there was one faculty member and one staff member who had come to Tiburon, and they were there primarily because their teenage kids said, we want to go there because of the youth group. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then uh, a couple of years after arriving, uh, I was invited to teach a class as an adjunct uh, in 2005, and I believe I've taught every semester since 2005. Mm-hmm. Um, and then in uh, 2008, uh, the the director for theological field education was uh, resigning and uh, moving back to his uh, uh, previous uh, position as a director of missions in Colorado. He asked me if I wanted to um, uh, be the interim director for about six months while the dean found a new uh, director. Mm-hmm. Who was the, the former TFE director? Uh, Greg Cole. Okay. And, and so when, when Greg asked me, I, uh, I, I ran that by the church and everything was fine. And so um, I started in December of 08 as the interim uh, director for theological field education. About a month into that, uh, Dr. Martin asked uh, if I was interested in taking the interim tag off. And uh, I told him, I said, if I can stay at the church, I'd be be glad to do that. And so he talked with the president, and uh, they worked the details out, and I started the process uh, and was elected to the faculty at the, I believe, the March trustee meeting uh, Mm -hmm. that year Mm -hmm. uh, of 2009. I think that was... I think you became interim while I was entering your TFE class, if I right, remember right. Right, right, I had started in a class with Dr. Ross Reinman, mm-hmm. and because of a scheduling conflict, which I don't remember anymore, um, the only other one that fit was yours. And so I ended the year, even though I was told that they hate that. <laughs> they yeah, want right, you to stay. exactly, exactly. Uh, and I understand. We, we do. You know, um, and I ran across I, I ran across that picture because we ended the year with a picnic down at the greenfield. That's right. <laughs> and I ran across that picture uh, a couple of weeks ago. So, oh yeah. <laughs> so interesting. And you were the only trustee elected faculty member serving part time. Is that correct? As far as I know, um, uh, that that continued. And as as I directed this, the the the, the half time part. Uh, when I first started, I did not have a teaching load. Okay. Now, typically, I always did teach a section of TFE, but I didn't have to, and so that was uh, con- considered extra. Um, and then uh, probably, um, that was in '09. probably two or three years after that, um, uh, Dr. McCoy came to me. He was getting ready for a half sabbatical, and asked me if I would be the interim department director while he was mm. on sabbatical. And so I said I would and met with the dean, and, 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 and Dr. Martin got me up to speed on what would be required there. But right before Dr. McCoy left, he uh, announced that when he came back, he was not going to resume his duties as the department director. 
And so it was during that uh, six months that uh, the dean asked me, said, uh, asked if I would be interested in continuing my role as the department uh, chairman. And, uh, and I told him that I would. And uh, at that point, then I found out that uh, they had not had a part-time uh, faculty member chair department before either. So a couple of firsts. <laughs> That's pretty cool. So in your current role, you're still in both of those roles, is that I'm right? In, I'm still in both of those roles. Except you're now full-time, is that correct? Uh, I, I went on full-time uh, May 31st of uh, 2015. I, uh, I resigned from my church and uh, started full-time on June 1 and uh, now have a half-time teaching load mm-hmm. uh, added to my uh, directing the uh, TFE uh, program. Mm-hmm. Well, one of my favorite questions that we've been asking so far is the next one. What are some of your favorite memories of studying or working or both at uh, Golden Gate Seminary at this location? Okay. I imagine over the years, especially since you started being uh, with your IMB work and then with your um, being more actively involved with the seminary administration side, you've had a chance to visit all of the other campuses, is mm-hmm. that right, of mm-hmm. this school? Mm-hmm. So for this campus, this Mill Valley campus, okay. what are some of your favorite memories of either studying or working or both? Okay. Um, I think from uh, my days as a student, um, I, I think we read the catalogs and we have an idea of what we think we want, and it's really not until we get here and get into classes and and really kind of get a feel for things do we really understand what we need rather than what we want. And so uh, I registered as a religious education student because in the catalog it said if you're going into college ministry in those mm-hmm. days, it recommended the religious education degree, which mm-hmm. would be, uh, I think, equivalent of our uh, educational leadership degree today. Mm-hmm. And so I started out in that. I, I only stayed in that uh, um degree for uh, one semester Mm -hmm. because before the semester was over it was apparent to me that I needed to take Hebrew and Greek and and theology and everything else that uh, was going to be required of of a pastor or anybody else uh, even in college ministry. Mm -hmm. So um, I uh, I ended up most of my electives ended up being religious education electives just because I was already in those classes and when I switched over yeah. um, I already had them so they that's the only place they would fit um, I think uh, I think I, I look back and I think of the faculty and the, and the, uh, the folks that were in place when I was a student and and really uh, appreciate the those years of relationship with students and faculty. Um, I think Dr. Bill Hendricks probably played the biggest uh, part in my uh, uh, life as a uh, from the uh, when I was at the master's level. Um, that would switch over to Dr. McCarty during my doctoral level, and that and my relationship with Dr. McCarty then would continue on, and that was part of my unbroken. Even though he was no longer at the seminary. Mm-hmm. Um, after after I finished my uh, uh, DMIN uh, degree, uh, I continued on uh, leading the uh, uh, supervision training that our our DMIN and TFE programs are all built upon. Uh, I continued to be a part of that training with the Home Mission Board, and then later when I was at the IMB, um, traveled around the world doing that providing that supervision training for our missionaries worldwide. Mm-hmm. Um, so those were, that, that's kind of one string of, 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 uh, of things that really uh, stick out as, as being really uh, made this time special and, and uh, um, really, really made this a memorable experience in every way. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think um, the uh, the other portion of uh, after I got on the faculty, um, uh, Dr. Cole had suggested that I uh, join and be a part of the Association of Theological Field Educators national 
organization. Mm. Um, and and in my very first um, annual meeting uh, or biennial meeting of, of that uh, organization, uh, one of the options that was available to us uh, was uh, one of the breakout sessions was an examination of your uh, program's written materials. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, well, what better way to kind of let somebody else tell me how we're doing mm -hmm. and what I'm inheriting yeah. than to do that. So, mm -hmm. uh, so I agreed to that, be a um, participant in that, meaning that I had to send them electronic copies of everything that we produce and hand out every mm -hmm. form, every, every everything. <laughs> And, um, I've gone and, through TFE. I know there's a lot of that. Yeah, yeah. There, it was a it was a lot of a lot of stuff. And um, I got to the, uh, the the that particular meeting was in Puerto Rico, uh, first time they'd had their meeting outside the continental U.S. And um, and so I was at a a reception, kind of a fellowship time, right before going into that uh, uh, workshop. And one of the uh, guys who was on the panel uh, uh, leading that saw my name tag and uh, introduced himself and said, hey, we're looking forward to you being in the conference. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he said, tell me a little bit about Golden Gate. And so I sat down with him, and, and there were three of us sitting at the table. Only two of us were having the conversation, but mm -hmm. it wasn't necessarily private, so we weren't, you know, we were just was talking. And so I told him a little bit about uh, Golden Gate uh, Seminary and, and, and really a, a lot about Dr. McCarty. Uh, I asked him if he knew Doran McCarty, and he said, no, I don't. I uh, haven't ever met him. And he uh, 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 he asked me a little bit more to, to share, and I said, well, I said I would describe him as the godfather of uh, TFE at, <laughs> at Golden Gate Seminary and, uh, and told him why I felt that way because, you know, his fingerprints are on everything we have and do <laughs> still to this day. And so he, uh, he uh, thanked me for the conversation and said, I'll see you at the workshop. And he got up and walked away. The third guy at the table scooted over to his chair, and I looked down at his name tag, and it was the TFE guy from Harvard. Wow. And, um, and so uh, he, said, he said, you need to know. He kind of pointed at me at, at that point. He said, you need to know that Dr. McCarty is the godfather of TFE uh, for all of us. He said, we've all ridden on his coattail and, and leadership and things that he has done through the years. Wow. And, uh, and so he said, uh, he said you, guys, you guys have good, you came from good DNA and, yeah. and uh, have, have, have good roots. And so uh, just, just know that that's true. So a couple of years after that, um, one of the, there's a, I don't even know the name of the organization, but it's on the college uh, Baptist College level, okay. they were having uh, their annual meeting, and one of the people they were honoring was Dr. McCarty. Mm. Well, I, I'm on that mailing list, and so they said, if you have any anecdotes or anything you want to share, we'll be glad to uh, uh, share that. Uh, and so just send it to me. So I sent him that story, and they used that as the intro <laughs> to uh, that evening when he was uh, uh, honored at this particular uh, gathering. So... <laughs> Uh, it's, 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 it's been a pretty cool relationship. <laughs> That's really awesome. What is your most prized achievement um, that you earned while you were here at this campus? Prized achievement. You can take that however you want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think I, I've, I, that's really an easy question for me because um, uh, in the old days when uh, it was the first day of class, uh, the director of TFE would come around to each classroom with a stack of notebooks. Each notebook was about three inches thick, the big giant ring binders, and we would hand every student their notebook, and it had all of the forms that they had to fill out for the whole year. Yeah. Okay? Well, then we migrated to a, a disc, a compact disc, and we would hand out the disc and say, okay, now put this on your desktop and... And we'd show them how, you know, all, where everything was located in the files. Uh, but it really took the place. All the forms were still there, but it was in disk form. Mm -hmm. So when I came on as the director for TFE, uh, it was my dream that we would have a system by which uh, a, 
a mentor would simply log on, uh, fill out the report, hit submit, and be done. No more emailing a report, no more copying off and having to, you know, mail it or mm-hmm. anything. So uh, for about a two, nearly a two-and-a-half to three-year period, I was just in search of that. Uh, really, it was more like the Holy Grail because I wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't really finding much out there. But uh, uh, I guess it was about, uh, it'll be about three years ago this May, um, the very, uh, at the end of the year, we have conference evaluation. Every student comes into my office with all of their mentors and the professor, and we have that final hour-long conference evaluation. Mm-hmm. Um, the very first one of those, about three years ago, uh, I found out that that particular student was, by night, was a seminary student, but by day, he was a programmer in Silicon Valley. Mm. And, and worked down, you know, in the and been in the computer world for many years, and so when I found that out, I asked him. I said, "Hey, can we talk after our co- your conference?" And he said, "Yeah." And so uh, I pulled him aside, told him what I said. You've just finished TFE. You've filled out all these reports. You know exactly what I'm looking for. I said, "Here's my dream," and I shared with him that the, trying to get this online and get it into that format. And so he asked me. Uh, several questions and over the next two or three days we emailed back and forth and then about three days four days later I get an email from me so I think I found a company that will work with you mm-hmm. now fortunately I had told them how much budget we had mm-hmm. and I told him I said I've got twenty five hundred dollars that I can use up until the end of July and then on August 1st I get two two thousand more so I have forty five hundred dollars total mm-hmm. So I said, I, I don't think we can do much with that, but, you know, mm-hmm. let, let me know what you think. Well, he had shared that, that piece of information uh, with this company. And so he said, do you want me to phone interview, email interview, or you need to bring them to you? I said, you bring them to me. So he brought them physically to this office right here where we're sitting. Mm-hmm. And on this conference table, I had a screenshot, which I'd made up uh, in a Word documents, but I had I had created what I wanted every screen to look like and what it needed to say. I, I had everything. I mean, this table was full and even extra. <laughs> and uh, and so this couple came in. They uh, a software company uh, um, uh, uh, from down in uh, San Jose area, and uh, they came in and uh, I kind of explained. And then we walked through the screenshots. And they were just kind of sitting there kind of dumbfounded because they said normally when we meet with a client for the very first time, they don't even know what they want. <laughs> but they said, you've, you've done our first several weeks of work for us. Mm-hmm. And so we, you know, it's really clear to us what you want. And then I said, okay, I said, well, I said timing. I said, what, what do you think we're looking at time-wise? Now, remember, this is the 1st of May, mm-hmm. early May. Mm-hmm. And uh, they said, well, we should, have, we should be able to have something up and running and to be able to show you a, a, you know, a, a beta version by mid-July. Well, when she said mid-July, I thought, wow, we could have this in place before the mm-hmm. fall. Mm-hmm. Awesome. And um, mm-hmm. so, so when, that, when she, she told that uh, uh, part to me, and I said, great, I said, well, I said, let's talk about how much this is going to cost. Um, and so she kind of smiled, and she said, she said, you know, our student friend had shared with them how much budget I had. She says, we know how much money you have. Mm-hmm. And, and she said, and she says, we are all the time looking for uh, community service projects mm-hmm. in which to give back to mm-hmm. the community. And she said, you fit exactly into, you know, what we're looking for and what we can do. So we're willing to do it for that price. Wow. Okay, and so so uh, to 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 make this even longer story, uh, let me wrap this up because because I could go on for days on this. This was so exciting. So um, one of the other TFE uh, professors, when I shared with him, he said, "Are we giving them a receipt so that they can on their taxes they can have they can 
get credit for ever how much the total work is. And I said, yeah. no, I didn't think of that. So I called her up and I said, you make sure you clock the exact hours and you give us a bill at the end. And then you can write the extra off. She didn't even know she could do that. She mm-hmm. said, but she checked in with her CPA sister that does all of their books. And she said, absolutely <laughs> get that. So it worked out. Well, we found out when, when the final thing was uh, finished, uh, we had paid forty five hundred dollars, and we got a bill for twenty four thousand dollars. Wow! And uh, and I, every day I think about the fact that God was really good, uh, put us in the with the right people at the right time, and uh, mm-hmm. so it was it was really. I think that's probably the biggest accomplishment was yeah. uh, getting us off of the notebooks and the CD ROMs to a system where. A, mentor logs in, fills out his report, hits submit, and he's done. Mm -hmm. I think I was in one of the last groups with the CD, Mm -hmm. if not the last group, (laughs) and Adam and I are in the MRG group for one of the students this year, and I think it's a lot better than what we (laughs) we went through. It's a lot more straightforward. (laughs) No paper. Yeah, that's right. No envelopes. That's right. Figuring it out. It's just log in, fill it in, submit, done. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Before yeah. the announcement of the se- of the Mill Valley campus, the before the announced sale of the Mill Valley campus on April first, twenty fourteen, what was your impression of the relationship between the Mill Valley campus and our neighbors? Well, I was aware. I was aware that there was a lot of disgruntled folks in the neighborhood, um, and uh, and I'd gone to uh, several of the meetings that took place with the city council or the county folks at the civic center, and so the, the handwriting seemed to already be on the wall mm-hmm. uh, that uh, that the the roadblock was in place and. And it really was way more than a roadblock. I mean, it was a brick wall. And meetings like that, did those start as early as like '09? Is that right? Where it was becoming clearer and clearer that there was no way forward? Yeah. Uh, uh, the clarity started to come once the, and I don't even know the ti- exact titles of it. You'll have to get this from the uh, from Doctor Orge's office. But there was this twenty-five year. Uh, site plan or mm-hmm. something, master whatever, plan. master plan, that's mm-hmm. it, that um, had uh, either w- had expired or was about to expire, and we were starting the, just the normal routine process mm-hmm. of refiling, you know, that, and it was that plan that w- we soon learned was not, didn't have any hope of getting passed mm-hmm. again, and... Uh, and so it was just a it was a it was a nightmare. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, I, we do would hear at faculty meetings and faculty retreats and other times that it was just one stoppage after another and one uh, you know one hurdle after another that we were never going to get over all of them. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. It, it was it was it was a difficult day. So um, how did that change? that impression of the relationship between our campus and the neighbors. Uh, how did that change, if at all, after uh, the current president, Dr. Or- Jeff Orge, announced the sale? Because uh, that will, that's, right. even with the movement of things, there's that's still kind of a catalyzing moment for sure. the next phase of relating this campus to its neighbors and vice versa. Sure. Did that change? Uh, well, I think the change the, came in that, that uh, Strawberry had historically never had a homeowners association, mm-hmm. and now they had one, and it was it was put together with the expressed intention of blocking the seminary from moving forward with anything, mm-hmm. and so um, it, it was it was uh, it was apparent uh, that that road was not going to be easy, uh, and 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 likely not possible to even move that direction at all. Um, having been on a church staff in the county mm-hmm. f- for uh, uh, several years, um, it's, it becomes common knowledge really fast that uh, uh, building or building improvement or anything of that nature in Marin County 
just look, realize you're in for the long haul, and uh, there's going to be uh, reports and, and tests asked for that make absolutely no sense uh, whatsoever, and yet the, the county has the right to ask for them, mm-hmm. ask you to pay for them, and then they not help one iota toward moving you to your uh, Tiburon uh, as a church has experienced, you know, some of those same things through the years. So mm-hmm. we were already aware of those, uh, that those difficulties coming. Mm-hmm. Were you in on the discussions surrounding the potential sale before it was finalized? No. Uh, I, um, that day on April 1st in the chapel, I, I, w- I was totally, totally t- taken by surprise. Mm. What was your about, uh, opinion about the sale at that time? Okay, okay. Um, well, I mean, you said your supr- the first initial uh, su- reaction was surprise. Total surprise, as you, as but said, but, but in in a, in another way, uh, from a common sense standpoint, not surprised at all. Mm-hmm. It, it really was the only direction that the seminary was being given was in that direction mm-hmm. was an exit mm-hmm. uh, rather than. Uh, being able to accomplish anything that we needed to accomplish here on campus, mm-hmm. so uh, uh, it was a it was a it was a shock. Uh, I I remember sitting there in the chapel and 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 thinking I'm not I'm not really surprised by the announcement, but the announcement brought the reality of it yeah. into focus, and um, and it was I mean I was. Uh, uh, it, um, I remember, you know, tearing up and and really thinking, "Wow, this is this life in this place is coming to an end." Yeah, it, you know, we're about to leave here and uh, never to return here. Yeah, uh, and 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 for me, you know, uh, Golden Gate Seminary had been uh, in and out of my life since 1979, mm-hmm. and so. Uh, all of those years of knowing that, you know, you know, don't know. So, some of those years I didn't know when I was going to be back on campus, but uh, uh, never dreamed that I would be back as a faculty member. But uh, it was a, those were hard, that was a hard day. Yeah. It's less than six months until the move from Mill Valley to Ontario. Has your opinion about the, ch- the sale changed since it was announced? No, my my position and feelings about it haven't changed at all. Um, I think what I'm I think what I'm feeling now is, uh, uh, and it's and maybe maybe I shouldn't be humored by this, but it's a little humorous to me for us to drive through the community now and see all the No Branson signs, mm-hmm. and and to realize that. Uh, uh, when they closed the when the seminary uh, the the seminary community basically said no to the seminary, they were saying no to Christian graduate students that really have been an integral part of this community for the last sixty years. Mm-hmm. They've been an, you know an, an invaluable part and a, just a, an ongoing presence of of uh, you know in my day. Um, uh, about every other student either house sat for somebody, uh, served as gardeners for people, mm-hmm. uh, just did all kinds of, of, of odd jobs around uh, the uh, community, plus, uh, you know, working in the local mm-hmm. uh, establishments. And today, uh, I mean, I don't know what Starbucks is going to do. Uh, <laughs> you know, there's so many of the coffee places and, and Pete's and other places that uh, that rely upon uh, seminary uh, staff to work. That's um, right. You can't go in a coffee house in this county without one person being a Golden Gate student. Yeah, at uh, any time of the day. I'll, I'll, <laughs> and I'll share you. I'll share with you the difference. Um, one of our members at Tiburon owned the uh, Outback Steakhouse, and and he would tell me that uh, he was all the time hiring. Um, you know, high school kids from the county and seminary students, and he says they don't even compare. They don't <laughs> compare because he said most of the most of the uh, high school kids they really didn't need the money. It was just mom in some ways making them get out of the house and find a job, 
And if they had something better to do that day, they'd call in sick. Mm. He says, but, but he says, my seminary students, he says, they needed the work. They wanted the hours, mm-hmm. and they were, they were helpful in every way. So he says, he says it was not even a good comparison when you compare the workforce. And the community may not realize how they're about to lose all of that. Yeah. And they're going to trade those Christian graduate students for entitled high school kids. You know, yeah, or junior high kids, depending on how. Or junior high kids. depends on, yeah, exactly. You mentioned the no Branson signs. Can you, from what you know of it, uh, can you explain that for our listeners who maybe don't live nearby, don't know okay. uh, what that signifies? Yeah, um, uh, I found out um, that the original deal that uh, the seminary was asked to make was uh, was originally asked to be a three-legged deal with three parties involved the seminary the land holding company and an unnamed third party but the seminary said no we will deal with the land company f- first and then after that you can deal with the third party on your own mm-hmm. and everybody speculated as to who they thought that might be and then um, as the moment that the sale came out uh, and was announced, then the uh, the word was out that that third party was Branson, uh, which is a private high school here mm-hmm. in, in Marin County. Um, a couple of days after that, uh, one of the uh, members of our church whose children had gone to Branson mm-hmm. showed me the letter from the headmaster uh, basically saying their plans and here's what we hope to do and and uh, and this is kind of the you know coming next for Branson. Mm. Well, now that 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 everybody in the community knows who that third party is, these no Branson signs have popped up. Mm-hmm. And um, there's a I don't recall the uh, seminary I don't remember the the website that's listed on the bottom of it, mm-hmm. but there's a little website down there. So I went to the website just to read up and say, you know, what they had to say. Mm-hmm. And um, is that from that uh, neighborhood association there? Yeah, mm-hmm. I, as far as I know, that's who it's from. Okay. It's, uh, I believe, it's seminaryneighbors.com or org or something like that. Mm-hmm. I don't, I don't remember exactly. Mm-hmm. But um, when you read through their material, there's no out and out lies in there, but they don't tell the whole truth. I mean. I grew up with Perry Mason, where you tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. <laughs> well, this doesn't fall into those. All they didn't meet all three of those criteria, mm-hmm. and uh, and and part of the part of the issue that comes out in there was about when they say that the seminary wouldn't communicate with us, and the seminary back, you know, left the the uh, bargaining table, and the seminary wouldn't do this, and the seminary wouldn't do that. Well. I know for a fact that that's not all. That's not really the way it came down. At least mm-hmm. not the way they present it. Yeah. Uh, you know, because um, like the seminary tried for years to work it for out. For years, absolutely. The sale was announced, as we mentioned, on April first, two thousand fourteen. But I remember meetings with the community as far back as two thousand and nine. Yeah. At yeah. least exactly. If not prior to that. Yeah. That's five years. That's a child goes from birth to <laughs> kindergarten in five years. That's right. Five years actually is a significant amount of time. Right. Right. Yeah. What do you hope the seminary will prioritize as they make this historic transition? Hmm. I think that's pretty clear that uh, that the seminary needs to stay focused on the main thing, and Dr. Orge has been really clear at that point that uh, we're not about buildings and we're not about lots of things, but we are about uh, raising up uh, the leaders for the next generation uh, for churches and ministry and missions and and everything else. And so I think, uh, I I don't think that's going to change. I think that priority is is clear. And uh, and Dr. Orge has has really uh, given uh, the appropriate leadership in that direction to say, "Hey, we need to stay focused," mm-hmm. and 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 I guess I shouldn't be surprised, but uh, but he brings back to our attention on a regular basis how the rest of the Southern Baptist Convention are just shocked that we're all still talking to one another and <laughs> civil and nice and focused and 
moving moving in the right direction. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, that is something I've noticed going through the buildings is everybody is working together to make to make it towards the goal of the seminary. Right. Even with there are offices that have moved to Ontario already. IA is mostly down there. Institutional advancement is already mostly down there. Mm-hmm. Uh, the student services VP is down there. While at least two, if not three, of his staff are still up here. Mm-hmm. Um, well, you can see my office. My books are gone. Yeah, your books are gone. And the your reason walls are bare. the reason I cleaned out is because those are Dr. Ganey's uh, bookshelves, <laughs> and he's moving over here because everybody has to move out of that building over to this uh, building. Yeah. And so, uh, so anyway, we've been communicating, and and so he's getting ready to start uh, uh, moving his library now that mine's out of the way. So yeah, everyone just seems to be focused and making it work. Yeah. The registrar isn't getting bogged down with petty squabbles. The business office isn't. The student, none of them, student services, uh, the, the all the administrative assistants in the Kim School of Missions, no, none of them are getting bogged down in pettiness or, or stress about any of that. They're getting their jobs done. Yeah. Students are getting in classes. They're getting their the resources they need. The library is operating at normal capacity even up to this point. When they could easily give up and say, it's, it's March 15th. We're moving in less than three months. <laughs> Let's start packing up these books and just quit. Let's just lock the doors. Get them out of here. That's right. They don't, they're not doing that. They're still operating. They're still providing services to these students. Yeah, I, uh, sent, uh, I, sent, I sent Dr. Orge a, um, a little clip of an old commercial. I don't remember who it was, but uh, I think it was an old Ross Perot commercial when he was still doing <laughs> computers, but it was a picture of an airplane flying, and the fuselage was still being built as they <laughs> as they were flying, and it showed a, in, you know, inside, one side, seats were in, and there were passengers sitting there with the wind blowing through their hair, because <laughs> there's some of the walls aren't up yet, and they're installing seats on the other side, and, uh, and I told him, I said, you know, this is what it feels like. We're we're um, making the transition and staying fully operational yeah. at the same time, yeah, and, <laughs> and uh, it's just uh, it, it's it's been amazing to that. And so anyway, mm-hmm. it's been kind of uh, interesting to be a part of it in the middle of it. That was Dr. Glenn Prescott, the director of theological field education at Golden Gate Baptist Theological Seminary. Jonathan, what did you especially enjoy about this episode today? Again, I've really liked hearing. Um, about how Golden Gate has become a model to to other schools. Yeah, um, it makes me proud to be an alumnus of of this school, and it makes me really appreciate and notice some of the things that I didn't notice at the time about my TFE project. Yeah, certainly, I had the same experience. I think um, in that room, it, it's ha- kind of hard in the middle of the TFE to be able to look over and figure out why are we doing all of this <laughs> right there's so much work it feels a little bit like drowning but in a good way yeah <laughs> <laughs> um i i really enjoyed his uh frankness with us about his experiences his um i enjoyed his connection his long connection with the seminary as a student uh, initially and then coming back so many years uh later with all of these different experiences connected with the seminary until finally uh, serving on the seminary directly as professor and then administrator now. Um, And off he goes, like so many others, to uh, the new Ontario campus in Southern California. I certainly am going to miss him as he goes to Southern California, Yeah, but the TFE program is in very good hands with Dr. Prescott. I agree. The next episode will be with Dr. and Mrs. Kent and Katie Philpot, ministers at Miller Avenue Baptist Church in Mill Valley, California. Just as a reminder, episodes release every two weeks with a new interview right here on iTunes, YouTube, or your personal favorite podcasting app, whether it's a Windows phone or not. Episode 7 with Kent and Katie Philpot will be available June 24th. I still like Windows OS. <laughs> <laughs> Please uh, subscribe so you don't miss an episode. 
Um, and rate and review. This way other people can know that this is a podcast worth listening to. If you don't think it's worth listening to, go listen to something else. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, you may already have. Uh, <laughs> Without anything else to add for this episode, we're going to go ahead and close. May God bless you as you go. He's already gone before. <laughs>